Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is a presentation of the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. STAP is a project of the Clean Energy States Alliance. And our topic today is energy storage industry updates. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by Todd Olinsky paul He is the STAP project director at CESA. And we have two guest speakers with us from GTM Research. And before I pass this over to them, I would like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our audience members are in listen-only mode today. That means that you can hear us, hopefully, but we can't hear you. You have two options to connect to the audio portion of this webinar. You can use your telephone or you can, your computer mic and speakers, and there's some instructions for that on your screen. Um, a very important note, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar as you think of them. And you can do that by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. And we will be reading through your questions uh, throughout the webinar. We will save some time at the end of the webinar for a Q&A with the audience. Um, we have a lot of people uh, who are expecting to attend this webinar. A lot of people have registered, so type your questions in when you think of them so that we're sure to get to them at the end. Um, a final note, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar as well as our previous CISA webinars on our website at the web address that you see on your screen. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to our host, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd? Okay, thanks very much, Samantha. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar. This is, I think, the last STAP energy storage webinar of the year. Happy to say that we've got uh, more people registered for this one than we've ever had before, so uh, we're going out with a bang, and we'll be back uh, early in the new year. Um, but uh, meanwhile, uh, this is going to be a good one, so welcome. Uh, if you could just advance the slide, please, Samantha. I'm going to give a brief introduction um, of our energy storage program and CESA itself, and then I'll introduce our speakers. As Samantha said, we've got uh, quite a, a large number of people registered, so we'll try to leave a lot of time at the end for questions and discussion. Uh, please go ahead and start sending in questions as you think of them uh, by typing them into the webinar console on your screen, and uh, I will be uh, going through those as the presentations are being uh, being uh, uh, given, and then I'll be prepared to ask the questions at the end. So uh, before I go further, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Emery Zhuk of the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability, who funds the STAP program, and Dan Borneo of Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, who contracts with CESA for the STAT program for supporting us. Next slide, please. Uh, this little map gives you an idea of um, <clears throat> where we work on energy storage and uh, pretty much all over the map at this point. Uh, just to, to back up a little bit and give you the background information, so STAP is the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership. It is a project of CESA, which is the Clean Energy States Alliance. Uh, CESA is a nonprofit. We are based in Vermont. We work with states uh, all over the country to support them in their clean energy uh, initiatives, policy, and program development. And as I said, we do this energy storage work uh, under contract with Sandia and with support from U.S. DOE. And basically our, our work in energy storage comes under a couple of categories. The most important thing that we do is uh, that we bring states to the table to partner with US DOE and Sandia to uh, jointly deploy energy storage demonstration projects. Uh, the other thing that we do, which is uh, also very important is to disseminate information on energy storage, and that's done through these webinars and through other uh, things that we do, uh, reports and blogs and conferences and so forth. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a screenshot from our website, and the only reason that it's here is because I want to point out two items. The red arrow is pointing to the link where our STAP webinars are archived. 
This webinar, like all our others, will be is being recorded and will be archived on our website. So within a day or so uh, after this webinar is done, you can go find that uh, archived <coughs> recording and share it, view it, um, uh, you know, uh, post it for people to see and so forth. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we have a mailing list. Uh, there's a button there to sign up in the red circle on your screen. If you go to our website and find that Button, it will allow you to sign up for future for information about future webinars and other events and other publications and things you may find of interest. So we also welcome you to look through the website. We have lots of uh, reports, <clears throat> articles, uh, case studies, uh, and so forth. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's guest speakers and we'll get on with the substance of the broadcast. Uh, we're very happy to welcome Ravi Mangani and Brett Simon from GTM Research. Um, Ravi is a senior energy storage analyst there. Prior to joining GTM Research, he was a lead analyst at Photon Consulting where he covered downstream solar and started their energy storage practice. And prior to that, he worked with Ecolt. Uh, helping with their U.S. grid scale energy storage market development. He has over seven years of experience in energy storage as a consultant, analyst, and engineer. He holds a Master of International Business degree from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, Master of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Washington in Seattle, and a Bachelor of Chemical Engineering from the Institute of Chemical Technology in Mumbai, India. And I believe he's with us from India today. Uh, also, we have Brett Simon, an energy storage analyst at GTM Research. Uh, prior to joining GTM, Brett was completing his Master's of Science in Sustainable Systems at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and the Environment, and that's where he became interested in energy storage systems uh, through his coursework and his master's project. Brett also holds bachelor's degrees in mathematics and environmental studies from New York University. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ravi uh, first, I believe, and then Brett, and then back to Ravi again, and they're going to give us an update on the current status of the energy storage industry in the U.S. Uh, so Ravi, I'm passing it to you. Thanks, Todd, for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks to Clean Energy States Alliance to give us this opportunity to talk about uh, the state of the U.S. energy storage industry, which in itself is, is a pretty fascinating industry and, and has evolved a lot in the last uh, few months. So a uh, quick background on uh, GTM research and, and in the broader context, Green Tech Media. So Green Tech Media was uh, founded back in 2007 and uh, is one of the leading uh, information uh, services provider uh, in the clean tech space, uh, and, and m more more than information, we, we like to you know focus a lot on the analytics and and, and the data that goes behind uh, providing market intelligence to the industry. Uh, so G GTM Research is the market analysis and consulting arm of Green Tech Media, and within our GTM Research uh, umbrella, we have uh, different research practices, uh, including Solar uh, Grid Edge, which is our, our Smart Grid 2.0. Uh, version of our smart grid practice and uh, storage, which in a lot of ways uh, in, uh, interacts with both grid edge and solar, given how storage uh, fits into the overall uh, scheme of things and, and the transformation of grid and distributed energy resources uh, uh, activities that are going on in the market. So uh, we we started off this uh, report series back in uh, back in March of this year when we first launched our uh, U.S. Energy Storage Monitor. Uh, Year in Review 2014 report. Uh, this has been done in partnership with the Energy Storage uh, Association. Uh, so it's, it's a joint, uh, jointly worked uh, report series that, that we pro publish on a quarterly basis to provide uh, insights into what's happening into the U.S. energy storage market. So a lot of the content from today's presentation is based on our most recent uh, report that we released a few weeks back, which was the Q3 2015 U.S. energy storage monitor. Uh, with that being said, I'll hand it over to Brett to take it from here and uh, talk about uh, our, our key findings and, and, and uh, broadly talking about uh, the evolving, the, the rapidly evolving U.S. energy storage market. Over to you, Brett. 
Thank you for the introduction, Ravi. We'll start by talking about energy storage deployments in the United States. GTM Research released our Q3 2015 U.S. Energy Storage Monitor Report earlier this month. One metric GTM Research uses to report our data is power capacity, or megawatts. In Q3 2015, the U.S. had 60.3 megawatts deployed across all segments, doubling total installed capacity compared to Q3 2014. Energy storage projects are divided between two segments, front of the meter, which includes utility scale deployments, and behind the meter, which includes residential, commercial, and industrial deployments. The majority of deployments in Q3 2015 were in front of the meter, with most of these deployments happening in the PJM territory, an area which includes all or part of 13 mid-Atlantic and Midwestern states and the District of Columbia. Though the behind the meter segment saw lower capacity deployments in terms of megawatts compared to the front of the meter segment, Q3 2015 marked the largest quarter ever for this segment, growing over 15 times compared to Q3 2014. Now, I'm going to break down U.S. energy storage deployments even further, delineating deployments into three segments, utility, residential, and non-residential which includes both commercial and industrial installations. GTM has tracked energy storage deployments since Q1 2013, and vast changes have occurred in the market over time. Q3 2015 marked the biggest quarter ever for all segments, and the U.S. already surpassed 100 megawatts deployed in 2015 by the end of Q3. The residential segment in particular saw massive growth, with a fourfold increase over Q2 2015. Furthermore, over time, the non-residential and residential segments have increased their combined share of the market, making up almost 23% of total deployments in Q3 2015. Compared to the previous record of 18% of total energy storage deployments in Q4 2014, the non-residential and residential segments continue to gain traction as storage system prices decrease and large deployments of behind-the-meter solar PV continue across the country. GTM research forecasts that the behind the meter segment will begin constituting a larger share of annual installations compared to the front of the meter segment by 2020. GTM research also tracks deployments in terms of energy capacity, or megawatt hours. The U.S. saw 53.1 megawatt hours of storage deployed in Q3 2015. The behind the meter segment comprises a much larger share of total megawatt hours deployed compared to megawatts in Q3 2015. The reason for this occurrence is that the majority of front of the meter projects are deployed in PJM for frequency regulation, a short duration application. In contrast, most behind the meter systems are deployed for long duration applications. I'll talk in more detail about specific energy storage applications in a few minutes. Most energy storage systems in PJM have discharge durations of 15 to 30 minutes, which explains why the front of the meter megawatt hour value for Q3 2015 is about half of the megawatt value. PGM currently has a pay-for-performance metric whereby energy storage systems are compensated as a fast response resource under Reg D. Comparatively, most behind-the-meter storage systems have a discharge duration of around two hours, while some have discharge durations of as much as four hours. As a result, the behind-the-meter megawatt hour total is more than double the megawatt value. In general, behind-the-meter systems are used for applications such as backup power or time-of-use shifting, which require longer discharge durations. That is not to say front of the meter systems are never deployed for long duration applications. In fact, Q3 2014 saw a higher total megawatt hours of deployment compared to Q3 2015, despite lower total megawatts installed. The reason for this significant difference results from the fact that the 8 megawatt, 32 megawatt hour to hatch P wind project was deployed in Q3 2014. GTM research expects the average discharge duration scale systems to increase in the future as more projects are deployed for integrating renewables on the grid and providing transmission and distribution deferral. Now, I'm going to discuss the top energy storage markets in Q3 2015 in terms of total megawatts installed. PJM continued to be the largest utility scale market in Q3 2015, given the Reg D market I mentioned a few minutes ago. California came in second as utility procurements under the storage mandate AB2514 continued. California had significant behind-the-meter deployments as well, spurred by the S-chip incentive, 
which currently offers $1.46 per watt for energy storage systems for up to 60% of eligible project cost. Note that the S-chip incentive will step down by 10% as of the beginning of 2016, though the incentive will remain significant. PGM and California are also the first and second ranked markets for total utility scale installations overall. However, Q3 2015 marked the first quarter where Hawaii passed California for residential energy storage deployments, as a large number of projects were interconnected in Hawaii. Several other states also saw significant residential energy storage activity, including Arizona, Kentucky, and Nevada. California still ranks as the number one state for both residential and non-residential deployments overall. Next, I'm going to talk about energy storage system applications and the energy storage technology landscape. Energy storage systems have a variety of applications that make them a valuable asset. However, evaluating energy storage benefits is a complex process, dependent on several factors. Location on the grid, either in front of the meter or behind the meter, system charging and discharging rates, also known as C rates, and market rules and policies, including California's S-chip incentive or FERC orders 755 and 784. Taken together, these pieces create a three-dimensional grid that impacts the economic viability of a particular energy storage project. Energy storage can provide a number of benefits when paired with solar. The diagram above breaks down these applications by discharge duration and frequency of use while color coding them in terms of who benefits by adding storage to solar. Note that there are also benefits that standalone energy storage systems can provide for the grid and end customers. Energy storage is particularly useful for ancillary services, a term which describes a suite of services necessary to ensure a reliably functioning electric grid. Previously, I mentioned frequency regulation, a short duration ancillary service. At present, frequency regulation comprises the main use case for energy storage systems in the US, given PGM's Reg D market mechanisms I mentioned previously. Though PGM dominates this use case, other markets are beginning to pursue energy storage for frequency regulation. Resiliency is a use case that has recently gained a significant amount of attention, particularly in the Northeastern United States. Following disasters like Hurricane Sandy, states have begun investigating and implementing energy storage for resiliency. Paired with solar, energy storage can provide a stable supply of electricity in times when grid electricity is either unavailable or unreliable. New Jersey, in particular, has extensively investigated this use case. CNI customers are increasingly turning to energy storage for demand charge management. Most CNI electricity bills include a component that bills the customer for the highest demand during a month, usually in a 15 or 30 minute period in terms of dollars per kilowatt. Demand charges can often comprise up to 50% of a utility bill. Energy storage, however, can help reduce demand charges by discharging during these peak consumption periods lowering the overall peak and offering significant financial savings to the end customer. Time of use electricity rates are becoming more commonplace across the US. Under these regimes, electricity prices vary by time of day, season, or both. Energy storage systems are useful for arbitrage in these cases and allow users to store electricity during off-peak periods and discharge it during peak periods to avoid consuming high-cost electricity. This value stream is called time of use shifting. Energy storage can also be used to offset fuel costs. This case is particularly applicable in places like Hawaii, where much of the electric grid relies on expensive electricity generated via fossil fuels. In this case, stored solar electricity can be used rather than traditional generation sources, often offering significant financial savings. I could talk all day about each individual use case, but a key takeaway is that energy storage systems can add value of ways for a range of different end customers. Storage systems don't need to be locked into a single use case. Recently, there has been increasing interest in stacking value streams, that is, using an energy storage system for multiple applications. While stacking value streams is still not widespread, it offers another method for getting the most value out of storage systems. Next, I'm going to talk about the energy storage technology landscape. There are a plethora of vendors active in the energy storage space, supplying a variety of technologies. The vendor landscape has grown significantly in recent years, 
especially as a large number of energy storage startups have emerged and established, and established manufacturers ramp up their production. Lithium-ion batteries are the most ubiquitous technology. Their prices range from sub $400 per kilowatt hour to $600 per kilowatt hour. Though prices are declining rapidly and cost is expected to decrease between 30 and 50% by 2020. The majority of the lithium ion supply chain is concentrated in Asia, with a large number of manufacturers located in both Korea and Japan. Lead acid batteries are the oldest form of battery technology and are usually deployed for long duration applications. Nameplate capacity prices are between $150 and $200 per kilowatt hour, but systems are oversized by up to two times to accommodate shallower cycling depth, leading to prices of $300 to $400 per effective kilowatt hour. Flow batteries are an emerging technology with few commercial and demonstration projects deployed. Though the technology is cost competitive with lithium ion, vendors still need to prove commercial bankability. Flow batteries include a variety of chemistries such as vanadium based batteries and zinc based batteries. Sodium based batteries cost between $850 and $1,000 per kilowatt hour, but are competitive with lithium ion for long duration applications. There are relatively few sodium batteries deployed in the U.S. at present. Several emerging technologies in the battery space exist as well, including liquid metal, aqueous, and zinc air batteries. These technologies have seen very few deployments, and prices are mostly unclear at present. Recently, California utility PG&E announced procurements of 13 megawatts of zinc air batteries, while one megawatt hour of aqueous batteries were deployed in Hawaii earlier this year. Ultracapacitors are another emerging technology, with most projects in the demonstration phase. They're useful for high power, low energy applications. Similarly, flywheels are useful for high power, low energy applications. In electromechanical technology, flywheels have a cost of around $1,000 per kilowatt, with a price reduction of roughly 20% expected within the next few years. Recently, Several hybrid energy storage projects combining flywheels and batteries have been announced. Developers state that using flywheels can increase battery longevity. Furthermore, PG&E recently announced procurements of 20 megawatts of flywheels. Thermal storage offers valuable opportunities as well, especially for non-residential customers looking to reduce their air conditioning or refrigeration loads. With these systems, energy is used to store cooling, usually in the form of ice, during off-peak hours. The systems are then deployed during peak periods to reduce load from air conditioners or refrigerators. Compressed air energy storage, or CAES, involves compressing air in geologic formations and releasing it to generate electricity. CAES is an emerging technology with only a few projects deployed worldwide. However, several projects are under development in the U.S. at present, including one large project in Texas. A moment ago, I discussed a variety of technologies available in the U.S. At present, one technology dominates U.S. deployments, lithium-ion batteries. Though other technologies have seen decent shares of deployment over the past few years, notably lead-acid batteries, lithium-ion still accounts for over 80% of total megawatts deployed in the U.S. Over the last few quarters, lithium-ion has made up a greater majority accounting for 91% of deployments in Q3 2015. Lithium ion technology is attractive for its ability to perform well in both short and long duration applications. Specifically, the majority of deployments in PJM have been lithium ion based, as this technology is suited for frequency regulation. Furthermore, lithium ion batteries have experienced massive declines in price over the last few years a trend aided by innovations in the automotive and information technology sectors. Rapid price declines for this technology are expected to continue through 2020. Now, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Ravi Mangani, GTM's Senior Energy Storage Analyst. Thanks, Brett, uh, for the good, great background information on what's happening with deployments and the evolving technology landscape, uh, along with the applications that, that go along with these uh, very unique technologies. So let's, let's jump into talking about what's happening with respect to uh, the, the policy developments in, in, in different markets, 
at the same time, we'll, we'll wrap it up with uh, looking at uh, some specific examples of how the vendor ecosystem is expanding uh, through organic growth as well as uh, through, through different forms of partnerships and, and uh, product launches. So uh, in, what's been going on in the, in, in the, in the larger scheme of things? As, as Brett had identified a few minutes back, uh, California and PGM have been the, the, the largest markets for behind the meter and front of the meter uh, segments respectively. But what we are seeing is uh, a, a much broader uh, adoption of storage going on in, in states that, that uh, were, were even a year ago not looking at storage, uh, although we should point out that those, those same states are not necessarily looking to deploy storage in, in you know, tens or hundreds of megawatts quantity starting this year or next year, but it's, it's a start, and, and that's, that's exciting. So very quickly, what's, uh, what's going on in PJM right now? Uh, PJM very recently, uh, as, of, as of a couple of months back, uh, has uh, put an interim cap on more storage deployments uh, that, would, that would be able to participate in the frequency regulation market, the Reg D market, uh, which, which has been the largest driver for utility scale storage in the U.S. So that definitely has, uh, you know, has the industry concerned a bit, given that, uh, given that it, it was the largest market up until a few weeks back, and, and, and uh, even in terms of the, the total historical deployment terms, it is the largest market. But it, it definitely puts some brakes on, on what could happen in PJM, uh, which, which in fact is, is an indication of the uh, the the larger you know re regulation market opportunities that exist even across other U.S. Uh, states and and ISOs uh, because typically regulation capacity is is uh, or regulation procurement is typically around one percent of the total peak load of of any uh, RT or ISO territory. So that in itself puts an automatic cap in you know how much regulation services exist or how many megawatts of regulation services exist for uh, for all the asset categories, let alone storage. The the other activity that, that we want to highlight here is has been going on in California. Uh, as as uh, Brett had identified the A B twenty five fourteen mandate that requires all the IOUs to procure one point three gigawatts of storage in the next eight, eight to ten years. At the same time uh, has asked other non IO utilities or, or public utilities, I should say, uh, to at least look at storage and, and its economical uh, procure storage uh, by the next uh, procurement round in, in the next couple of years. So uh, a lot of activities have already happened in the last uh, 12 to 14 months uh, with respect to the three IOUs procuring uh, or, or blazing RFOs. And uh, SCE and SDG and, and pg &E have already announced their uh, 2014 obligation winners. Uh, they still have to be approved by CPUC, but but at least the winners have been announced. Uh, and and lastly, uh, what's also happening on a much more broader scale in California is activities in California ISO that uh, recently approved the the DERP framework, which stands for Distributed Energy Resources Providers. What it it means is, up until now, we've been talking about you know. Uh, very uh, specific value streams or single value streams or in, in some cases dual value streams. But with the opening of the DERP framework, uh, we could have behind the meter or generally speaking more distributed energy storage and other types of distributed energy resources participating in the wholesale market and, and uh, getting paid for their participation. So that, that definitely opens up you know, the, the whole notion of value stacking uh, in, in California. The, the other activity that, that I do want to highlight, and it, it's, it's pretty pertinent given that what has been happening with the potential ITC uh, extension that, that we've, that's been in the news for the last couple of days, uh, even, even prior to this uh, extension announcement of, uh, back in Q3, the IRS had solicited uh, public comments on their ITC framework to determine if energy storage should qualify on a more programmatic basis. We've had few projects, a uh, few solar plus storage projects where energy storage has been eligible to benefit from the ITC uh, or uh, in, uh, investment tax credits. But uh, this change, uh, which, which ITC is soliciting more information for, uh, could uh, lead to a more you know, broad scale uh, 
programmatic uh, inclusion of energy storage for IPC benefits. And to tie it with what's happening with the IPC extension, we, we could very well be seeing uh, solar, but also potentially solar plus storage, getting IPC benefits through the next eight years. Uh, there are a few other activities that, that I do want to highlight, but uh, again, the, the whole idea is that we've, we've seen activities not just in the big states or big markets, but other markets as well. Uh, states like New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, have been looking at not just storage, but grid modernization programs for their IOUs. And uh, within, those, within all of those programs, uh, storage will play uh, an important role. Uh, in fact, in, in some cases, there have been, uh, there have been some RFP activities uh, that we haven't seen any RFPs issued, but some RFPs proposed in the grid modernization plans uh, released by some of the IOUs in, in New England. The other uh, states that we are seeing storage uh, growth is uh, Texas and Arizona. Uh, both these states, uh, Arizona in particular, uh, the, uh, the IOUs uh, have been looking at storage procurements through different, uh, different RFE mechanisms. Uh, in fact, Houston Electric Power has selected two 10 megawatt storage projects under their renewable energy uh, program. And uh, states like Texas, like I mentioned, uh, although it, it, it hasn't uh, it did not turn into the the big market that that we initially expected uh, with with any potential changes in the legislature that would uh, m make the ownership of storage assets uh, more uh, you know open for even the transmission and distribution uh, companies such as Encore Encore in fact had uh, had uh, solicited and 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 a, a, a big report uh, which Battle Group released a few months back. Uh, talking about how storage can benefit the entire state if the system-wide benefits could be uh, stacked and, and be able to monetize by individual uh, asset owners. So that, that legislation hasn't gone through, yet we are starting to see some activities in, in, in Texas that could pave the way for uh, more regulatory uh, changes in, in, in the ERCOT, uh, ERCOT market. One such change is uh, the, the more recent uh, establishment of the Dream Task Force. The storage industry, and, and broadly speaking, the energy, you know, distributed energy resources industry loves acronyms. So uh, Dream stands for Distributed Resources for Energy and Ancillary Services Markets. So uh, figure out how we get to Dream, and and what that process is going to do is similar to what we just discussed in California, and, and also something that also going on in, in uh, New York is look at how distributor resources can participate uh, for wholesale market and grid, broader grid services. The uh, one other activity that, that was announced and is, is, uh, is uh, unique and potentially sign of things to come in the future is the 20-year uh, PPA agreement that KIUC, which is a Kauai uh, Island Utility Cooperative, has entered in with Solar City to uh, have a 20-year PPA uh, published at 14.5 cents per kilowatt hour from a 13 megawatt solar facility, which would be tied to a 13 megawatt, 52 megawatt hour lithium ion storage system. So that what the storage system would do there is, since uh, Hawaii faces the issue of uh, peak hour demand during uh, evening hours when, when solar is no longer available and, and uh, flat uh, demand, and in fact, in some cases, you know, uh, uh, more than 100, uh, more than 250 percent of their of their distributed load coming from uh, being met by distributed behind the meter solar. Uh, what that has done, done is uh, created this impetus for pushing the solar or shifting the solar output from the middle of the day for consumption during uh, evening peak hours. So this particular agreement would would do that, where it would shift the entire solar output from daytime to to evening peak hours when KIUC needs uh, peak generation. <clears throat> Some other activities that have been going on, on in the behind the meter markets. Uh, so far, we, we just talked about what's happening in front of the meter, but uh, some of the initiatives that we touched upon uh, with respect to California ISO's uh, DIRT framework, of course, applies to behind the meter opportunities too. But uh, other than that, there have been uh, activities happening with respect to the net energy metering reforms, which is what uh, 
Hawaii enacted a few weeks back in, in October. Uh, so, uh, so new solar customers in, in Hawaii can no longer access uh, net energy metering at full retail rate. And, and now there are two options for uh, end customers to deploy solar. One is the self-supply mode, which uh, doesn't necessarily have to have storage, but the value proposition for storage is, is definitely high, given that self-consumption typically uh, in, in real time is, uh, is 30 to 50 percent or 30 to 60 percent for any customer. So in, in order to access the remaining uh, 40 to 70 percent out of solar excess generation, which can no longer be exported back to the grid under the self-supply mode, would, would require storage. Similarly, the grid supply mode, uh, although allows for export, it allows for export at a much lower uh, wholesale price equivalent rather than a full retail rate. So a lot of these activities uh, that, that we've been looking at uh, have been purely from the standpoint of how storage can enable the grid to be more uh, reliable and efficient. We did a, a couple of case studies in a recent report where we, you know, given what's going on uh, or what, what in fact now in, in hindsight has already happened with COP21, uh, that uh, the, the world has, got, has united to, to reduce uh, their greenhouse gas emissions uh, and, and stick to the uh, 2 degrees Celsius and aim for the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, scenario for, for temperature rises. Uh, so, and more so on the national front, or on the uh, what's happening with respect to the clean power plan. So both these uh, re recent uh, policy and 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 uh, market developments have uh, have raised this question on how storage can be used, or is there any role for storage to play in in carbon reduction? So what we did was uh, looked at the the current uh, conversations that are going on in, in, the, in the California's self-generation incentive program, the ESTE program, uh, and, and in fact the ESTE program has recently enacted a, a, a new decision that has increased the minimum uh, efficiency, round-trip efficiency requirement for storage uh, to 66.5% uh, or 69.6 uh, .6 initial, uh, in initial of year one round-trip efficiency. So we looked at what that means for overall emission reductions. So at that minimum 66.5 uh, average round trip efficiency, storage, even when uh, not being paired with solar and just being used to reduce the, 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 the daytime peak and, and push it out to, uh, to, to off-peak hours, or rather I should say evening peak and push it out to off-peak hours by, by time shifting the, uh, the, the load and, 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 and uh, supply dynamics can in fact add that 66.5% round trip efficiency can result in a net zero uh, emission uh, change. But as we all know that most or a lot of these storage technologies can in fact be, can, and can have round trip efficiencies that are much higher than this 66.5% average requirement. So what we did was in fact look at what would happen if uh, we, we took a, a storage system that has about 84% initial round trip efficiency. And in fact, that can, in a, on, a, in a, on a 10-year basis, without even looking at how storage along with solar can, uh, can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is assuming the existing uh, mix of, of California's uh, generation assets can in fact reduce uh, the, the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions by 17%. Now, if you add solar, uh, the emission reduction could be much higher. But the point here is that storage, even as a standalone asset, can enable carbon reduction if uh, we use it to optimize the operations of our existing generation fleet, be it natural gas, coal, or other type of base loads, uh, base generation assets. So this definitely is, is a good example or a good case study of, of what storage is capable of doing, right? And, and definitely uh, indicates that storage will find a role uh, in, on, a, on a national level uh, to participate in, in, in clean power plan uh, program and by the, that, that when adopted by different states. And secondly, even on, on an international basis, uh, could have a role to play uh, as uh, individual countries look to 
fulfill their obligations uh, towards the uh, the new Paris Agreement. So uh, we've we've talked a lot about the markets, the technologies from a from a, at, at a very high level. Now let's talk about what's happening with respect to investments or, or financing of these individual companies, and at the same time talk about how the vendor ecosystem is evolving uh, through through different partnerships and business models. So if if you track uh, the storage investments uh, for for the year. They land at uh, 265 million. This was at the end of Q3. There have been at least uh, three more uh, financing rounds, uh, three more financing announcements made in the last few weeks. Uh, more recently, by Unicos that uh, announced uh, First Solar, uh, along with a couple of other um, investors, have invested 50 million dollars in, in in Unicos. So uh, by end of Q4 or the end of 2015, we expect that number to be much higher. Similarly. Uh, the the number of deal counts have been on a you know generally speaking have been on upward trend. 2014 definitely was the highest uh, both in terms of deal count as well as total uh, venture capital investment. However, uh, I do want to highlight that one of the investments that accounted for a big portion or 250 million dollars worth of, of of that of that big stack uh, came from. Uh, an investment that we that we uh, haven't been able to verify independently, and as a result of which, even if you you know uh, uh, subtract the 250 million from the 2014 bar, uh, we, we're still running at a pretty good rate, and 2015 would match uh, the, uh, the the revised 2014 numbers uh, by when when you know things are said and done. So that's with with respect to the investments. Uh, a lot of partnerships and M&A activities have also occurred in, in Q, just in Q3 2015. Uh, it, uh, I, I don't want to necessarily bore the audience by going into details on each one of them, but generally speaking, the trend that we are we are seeing is a lot of the upstream and midstream companies that are in cell or or battery pack uh, manufacturing are looking to. Uh, Collaborate and form uh, partnerships with some of the downstream companies. Uh, one such example that, in fact, was announced just yesterday was AES uh, also uh, an announcing a supply ag uh, agreement with LG Chem, where LG Chem would have uh, at least uh, uh, one gigawatt hour of uh, orders coming from AES uh, in, in the next few years. So again, an example of how. The, the 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 alliances are being formed in some cases in fact even through uh, mergers and acquisition uh, an example of of a of recent merger per acquisition deal would be uh, Dyson recently acquiring SACTI 3s uh, uh, solid lithium ion technology um, the the other sort of trend again if we can just look at trend is uh, a lot of the uh, Midstream or battery vendors, or in, and as well as the inverter vendors, are looking to how, to integrate these into a system, and and go into the market as a as a system, which which of course has you know uh, has implications on overall cost reductions on a system basis, but at the same time provide some of these uh, upstream and midstream vendors new markets to tap into. And uh, apart from the financing, the mergers and acquisitions, as well as the uh, the partnerships, there have been several new products announced uh, in in year 2015. Uh, a lot of the companies uh, coming up with new uh, products that are are designed to be more modular and can potentially help and standardize these systems uh, for wider utility scale adoption. At the same time, make it easier for and cust uh, behind the meter and customers to act to 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 deploy them uh, by reducing interconnection cost if, if there is standardized you know box approach we we saw what standardization has done for the solar industry in the last few years not just on the product side but also on the financing side uh, we we expect similar uh, innovations to occur in the uh, in the storage space as well so that that sort of you know uh, puts us gives us you know uh, about 15 minutes of, of question and uh, questions that you might have, uh, and so Brett and I are right here, uh, you know, looking forward to having this conversation with uh, all the folks and helping to answer some of the questions you may have. 
Great. Uh, thanks so much to both of you. Uh, it was a terrific presentation. We do have a number of questions, and um, if we do, if we don't get to all of them, we may be uh, extending this by five minutes or so to pack uh, a couple extra questions in at the end. But we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. <clears throat> so uh, one person wants to know. Uh, what's the anticipated acceptable energy storage cost in dollars per kilowatt hour, and is there a recommended energy storage efficiency? So I guess essentially what they're asking is, is there a target cost and a target efficiency? That's a, that's a great question, and uh, you, uh, for a presentation on energy storage markets, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners are surprised that we didn't put any slides on price and cost numbers. Uh, the reason for doing that is is it's it's still a moving target. Uh, I, I think a lot of the discussion uh, in more recent months uh, has been on energy storage cost terms, but in in our opinion, should also factor in you know what value streams is storage able to provide. So I'm I'm not dodging the question. The 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 point is that uh, the cost numbers are are meaningless uh, without understanding what applications you're going to be using. Uh, storage technology for, as Brett has identified, you know, even just looking at a narrow uh, scenario of solar plus storage applications, there are still multiple applications based on discharge duration as well as uh, how frequently those systems would be called upon to uh, to provide services. But get, that doesn't mean that there are no cost numbers or cost thumb rules that we can go with. So typically speaking, uh, you would be looking at uh, just the battery portion or just a DC side portion if it's a non-battery type of storage system uh, to be costing at about uh, $300 per kilowatt hour to $800 per kilowatt hour. That's a wide range depending on the technology. And then the non-battery or the BOS or the balance of systems or balance of plant depending on you know what, what you like to call that, that portion of, of a system uh, can range anywhere between uh, Three or four hundred dollars per kilowatt. So mind mind the the change in the metric. It's in dollars per kilowatt, not in dollars per kilowatt hour, and can extend can go as high as thousand dollars per kilowatt. Again, based on what application we are in and and what type of uh, where it's located and, and on the grid. The the second part of the question, the efficiency requirement. Uh, I, I think a lot of the uh, technologies uh, are are you know definitely getting better with respect to their uh, you know efficiency targets. And, and uh, each technology, again, has a very unique uh, set of characteristics. So looking at efficiency alone without looking at their other capabilities and, and characteristics would be, uh, would, 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 be, would be naive in our opinion. So on one hand, you can argue, oh, lithium-ion batteries can get you to 85 90% round-trip efficiency. They cannot necessarily be used for six hours discharge duration. On the, on the flip side, flow batteries can get you 65 70% round-trip efficiency, but they can be used for six-hour duration applications. So it, it's a balance of you know what application you're looking for. Okay, great, thanks. I want to dig down on the on the uh, cost numbers just uh, a little bit more. You you mentioned a range of I think 300 to 800 per kilowatt hour. Uh, is that is that range what we're seeing now, or is that because the questioner wanted to know is there a target? Uh, what where are we in, and and how far are, off are we from what uh, you see as sort of the target? And I guess a cost target would be where um, you see uh, that you know more applications are opening up, more markets are opening up. Uh, there's less need for for incentives and so forth. Great question, right? And and again, I'm I'm not going to dodge the question, but you have to keep in mind uh, new markets opening up at you know and under which regulatory frameworks uh, are we assuming that the regulatory frameworks and the market rules are going to stay as they are today and in which case we are still talking about storage uh, to be used in very limited types of applications then yes the, the cost numbers are not there yet we are, we are potentially talking about at least you know 50 to 60 percent more cost reductions until uh, more markets open up for these limited value streams but as, as I've stressed on before, and, and, and I hope the audience can take that away, is uh, the, the regulatory frameworks, the market rules are evolving, uh, as, as you might have seen in some of the slides that we presented. The policies are changing. So there are, there are a lot of moving pieces. If 
the conversation just stays on the cost targets. I don't think the industry is going to get to where where we think it can it can you know uh, provide uh, value as uh, to the to the grid to be more more reliable, more efficient, more resilient, and and uh, cleaner. Absolutely. I mean, we, we really you're right. I mean, we should really be looking more at payback period or something like that that takes both the costs and the value into account. Um, so uh, another related question, somebody wants to know, have there been any studies evaluating the trade-offs between cost and efficiency? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't think we have seen any particular studies that look at trade-offs between cost and efficiency. We've, of course, run our own internal models where we have used some sin different scenarios on, on cost side at the same time looked at different efficiencies as well. Uh, the, the, obviously, if you're looking at the levelized price uh, or, or, the, or the, some version of levelized uh, analysis, as, as uh, Toddy mentioned, you know, an NPV or, or, a, or a payback period, uh, given where the cost stands today, uh, I, I think the upfront cost is, is one of the, the bigger portions of the, of the levelized stack. Uh, so, and that's uh, obviously uh, bringing cost down is the bigger focus for the industry. Uh, the efficiency targets are are going to be, in fact, you know, a result of, of changes on 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 in the technology sort of advancements, uh, which are occurring simultaneously. But I, I don't think I've seen any particular study that that looks at this particular trade-off on on efficiency versus cost. Okay, thanks. Uh, somebody else wants to know what your opinion is or what GTM's opinion is on the market for storage for demand charge management in the industrial sector. So uh, which markets, in other words, uh, PJM, New York ISO, ERCOT, et cetera, will be the best markets for uh, demand charge management in the industrial sector? Do you have any, any uh, wisdom on that? Sure. So uh, we just uh, had our first U.S. energy storage uh, conference uh, last, uh, where in fact one of our key, uh, you know, kickoff keynote presentations was on precisely this question: which are the markets uh, for CNI demand charge reduction uh, that exist today, and, and where are they going? So uh, I, I, I think some of the slides are available on our website, but but broadly speaking, again, the the markets that are are open today are markets such as California, New York, where uh, the the rate tariff structures have high demand charge numbers. So when I say high, it's typically you know anything which is uh, uh, north of fifteen dollars per kilowatt uh, of demand charge. So those are the markets that are that are active today. But uh, as again the costs go down, uh, and and here we you know since we're talking about a single application, we can talk in terms of you know just the reliance on cost numbers. Uh, we, we assume that if the cost went down at, at roughly 15% uh, year over year for the next five years, by 2020, we expect at least uh, 10 markets which uh, would, would be economical uh, for demand charge reduction for CNI customers, and uh, around 18 other markets that would be just at the uh, at, at, at sort of the cusp of, of uh, taking off. Uh, and, and by markets, I mean states. The, the question here is, you know, uh, the a CNI load, a CNI customer is is not again, uh, it's not a monolithic uh, load profile. Different CNI customers, uh, different industrial customers have different types of load profiles. So there are some you know load profile characteristics that that have to be looked at along with you know the 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 rate tariffs that that exist within within the utility jurisdictions. Uh, again, thumb rules. If the uh, the load profile is is choppier or has more spikes. There is better, you know, higher uh, sort of efficiency in in shaving these off. If the load profiles tend to be flat, then uh, the, the the amount of storage that would be needed to shave a flat load profile would be much higher, which which makes the economics worse. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's an interesting question. Somebody wants to know which technology is the most used in housing in the multifamily sector. And by technology, I think the question is uh, battery type. Um, and I'm, I, I just want to add that you know we've seen uh, increasing interest 
in storage for resiliency purposes in this sector, uh, especially in the uh, you know an area in in facilities where there are elderly populations or uh, you know in uh, uh, you know low cost housing for example where people may not um, find it easy to for example relocate during a, a natural disaster which is uh, accompanied by a grid outage so um, so for that sector what's what's the technology I'm assuming it's lithium ion but what, what would that be right no, as a matter of fact, uh, again, if, if you just brought, you know, on a, at a broad scale, want to look at resiliency as a single application. In fact, storage is, is not necessarily economical for resiliency today. Uh, I, I think uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise, but uh, d diesel gensets or, or other forms of <clears throat> uh, fossil fuel-based gensets are the, uh, the, the leading uh, technology of choice. Uh, for these kind of applications. However, if we again narrow it down to storage, and if you're only talking about backup, where the storage system is, is being called upon only to provide backup during certain hours of the year and not necessarily a grid interactive asset, in, the, in those cases, in fact, lead acid is, uh, is, is uh, uh, the technology of choice. Again, given that it's, it's, it has a low upfront cost, uh, but at the same time uh, has lower efficiency, and, and lower cycle life. So if, if you're looking to use it on a daily basis, uh, which a lot of these storage applications are moving towards, then it, it definitely, uh, it, it, does, it doesn't uh, quite sort of uh, work out versus lithium ion, generally speaking. But if it's just backup, then lead acid is the, the technology of choice to provide backup and under you know, low, low income housing or, or multi, multi, family, uh, multi home uh, dwellings uh, that, that you talked about. Uh, the numbers that, in fact, Brett showed earlier in terms of technology adoption, uh, we uh, are, are looking at just the grid interactive or grid connected side of storage. So we are not necessarily including, or in fact, we are not including the off-grid or, or traditional backup type of uh, deployments that are also occurring in the market. Okay, thank you. Uh, somebody wants to know about foreign markets, and I, I don't know whether you are prepared to speak on this. Obviously, the, the topic of the webinar really is US, uh, the, the US uh, industry. But the question is, what are the leading foreign markets for energy storage, and how do they compare to the US metrics presented in this, uh, in this webinar? Uh, who are the leaders? Are there readily available quarterly and cumulative installation rates by market segments, use cases, technologies, uh, et cetera, for the leading countries? Excellent. So th that's a great question, and uh, I'll, I'll in fact have Brett answer part of it as well. But uh, U.S. I, I think is is definitely uh, one of the leaders when it comes to storage market opportunities. Uh, there are, however, some other markets that are interesting in their own regards, uh, namely Germany, uh, Japan, a uh, little bit of South Korea, and we started to see some interest in in uh, in markets like China, India, South Africa, and some other Latin American markets too. Uh, and uh, this is a cue for, for Brett, uh, Australia, which in fact we recently covered as uh, in one of our research reports. Yeah, that's a, that's a great segue, Ravi. Um, we did recently publish a report looking at Australia's energy storage market, and there the case is uh, quite different than the U.S. Um, there there's a lot more movement in the behind the meter sector, which is uh, a combination of a bunch of different factors. There is uh, very good uh, solar insulation in Australia, and that combined with some previously high feed-in tariffs has led to uh, rapid adoption of behind-the-meter solar PV. And that combined with rising electricity prices and the oncoming expiration of some of these feed-in tariffs builds a really good case for energy storage in Australia uh, in the coming years. Thanks, guys. So, so uh, just to follow up on this, um, you know, part of the question was whether there are, uh, you know, whether there's information available for other for the markets in other countries. So, quarterly uh, reports or in installation rates by market segment. Do you guys have that kind of? Uh, is that something that GTM uh, tracks? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, 
however, we haven't published any research reports in, in the recent months that look at non-US markets other than the Australia report that Brett pointed out. We do have uh, something what we call as the Grid Edge Deployment Tracker, where we are tracking some of the uh, global deployments as well as uh, 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 pipeline numbers for storage, uh, as well as some of the other Grid Edge technologies. Okay, great. As I said earlier, uh, you know, I think that we, we are going to extend this just a few minutes to try to get a few more questions answered since we have so many people on the, the uh, webinar as participants. Um, we'd like to get to a few more questions. Uh, so uh, one is, uh, what is the size of the frequency regulation market in the U.S.? I know we, we talked about PJM, but uh, there's certainly and that's the most active, but there's certainly uh, a market that goes beyond PJM for frequency regulation. Do we have a, a sense of the size of that market? Sure. Uh, so I'll give, you know, again, high-level thumb rule numbers. This is assuming that uh, the frequency regulation opportunities are equal in, in all the ISO and non-ISO markets, which is not the case. So for a, a quick backgrounder, FERC had uh, had really, uh, had had ordered all the ISOs that are under FERC's jurisdiction through order 755 and 784 to A, include storage for frequency regulation, and B, come up with the, uh, the, the settlement mechanism that incorporates the, the value that storage provides being a more efficient and, and a faster and, and, a, and a more reliable uh, technology to, to follow the, the ups and downs that the regulation market uh, usually uh, has to meet. So uh, not all the ISOs have enacted uh, the, the the fork orders to, to the same extent that PJM has. So again, it's a function of you know how have these ISOs and RTOs looked at the the uh, the fork orders and and how have they implemented or or, or modified their regulation market rules to uh, allow storage to participate. So with with that big big general observation. There are other markets like uh, Midwest ISO, SPP, uh, which is Southwest Power Pool, uh, even California ISO, uh, ISO New England, uh, New York ISO, so I've pretty much named most of the ISOs that have enacted or are in the process of enacting the fork orders 755 and 784, but haven't seen the same level of traction that, that PGM has because the, the way in which these laws were enacted. So taking a step back, Assuming that the the total addressable market for for frequency regulation is uh, based on how PGM has enacted its policies, we are looking at uh, roughly again thumb rule about one percent of the total peak capacity in any market. Uh, in some markets, it might be slightly lower, in some markets, it might be slightly higher. But generally speaking, that one percent mark. So uh, that. With that number in mind, uh, I, I think the total addressable market for uh, for storage to participate in frequency regulation is is uh, close to six gigawatts. Okay, and so just to clarify that, that's a that's a large number. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that uh, those markets are always accessible or easily accessible to to storage providers. Correct. Precisely, precisely. That, that is correct. Okay. So I know that, uh, you know, the PGM market really took off uh, in large part because there were a number of FERC orders that basically established a, uh, a level playing field for distributed generators and storage providers and, um, you know, demand response providers and so forth and and uh, pay, by, pay by performance uh, standards and then the uh, fast regulation market w uh, uh, rules, which allowed for uh, uh, higher rates for better, more accurate response. So, you know, given those kinds of conditions, uh, apparently uh, storage can do quite well competing with other resources, but it, it did require a certain amount of uh, market opening to make that possible in PJM. Okay, thank you very much. We do need to wrap this webinar up. We are just about out of time, but we do have some time for some final closing words from our guest speakers today. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to close out the webinar, Ravi or Britt? Sure. Um, very quickly, right? Uh, I, I think uh, this was a great uh, 
opportunity for us to talk about the uh, evolving energy storage market in the U.S. Uh, quick uh, sort of uh, takeaways that, that I would have for, for the audiences, we shouldn't just be looking at cost but value streams and, and in that sense how is the market evolving uh, and, and how are the policy mechanisms as well as uh, different market rules, be it wholesale markets or, or, or other individual state markets that are looking at storage. Uh, there are, there are at, you know, depending on who you talk to, there are at, you know, anywhere between 12 to 27 use cases for storage uh, and, and each of those use cases have their own independent uh, value depending on, on which, which geography we are located in. So it's, it's a much more complex metrics uh, and, and it, it requires us you know, better understanding of, of what value stream storage can provide. That being said, uh, we, are, we are fairly optimistic uh, about the, the opportunities that storage can, uh, has in, in the U.S. market for the next five years. So uh, quick numbers, we expect that U.S. will install uh, 192 megawatts of uh, grid connected storage uh, this calendar year 2015 and by 2020 we expect that number to be uh, over 1.3 gigawatts uh, of total of annual storage deployments uh, in, 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 in all the U.S. markets. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Brett, closing words? No, I think Ravi had a, a great closing remark. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who came to the webinar, and thank you very much, uh, Sam and Todd, for bringing us in today. It was a great experience. Thanks very much. Thanks to everybody who participated. And uh, Samantha, do we have any upcoming webinars you want to mention? or? We don't, actually. This is the last webinar of the year that we have, okay. um, but we will have some starting in the new year. Um, and this webinar will be posted on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars for anyone okay. looking for that. Thanks very much for everyone who participated. Happy holidays, uh, happy new year, and we will see you again in January. Bye-bye.